Everybody, welcome back to the Evolution of Sport. Uh, our next talk is super interesting. It's Peter Fatty, who's done a lot of research on pitch recognition. He's here to talk about the sixth tool. So with that, I'll welcome Peter to the stage. About 10 years, 10 plus years, I've been researching pitch recognition in one way or another. And so it, it really is a treat to speak to this group because analytics has had so much to do with not just measuring pitch recognition, but actually defining it, making it a more definable skill. So what we're talking about is the raw skill, the raw perceptual cognitive skill of pitch recognition. Now that gets expressed then as selective hitting, plate discipline. Uh, for instance, um, Fangrass now has a line for plate discipline. Some really nice uh, metrics in there. Uh, that's one way of expressing it. The um, photo here is from the 1999 Sports Illustrated Baseball Preview referencing the 1998 Yankees World Champion team that set a, a record, an all-time record for pitches per at-bat with Knobloch leading off. And um, that's one way of expressing it. But of course, the way Ted Williams used to say was, you know, get a good ball to hit. So it's not, not a passive skill. You can, you can work. You can be working it for walks, working uh, up the pitch count, getting into the bullpen, that whole kind of Joe Torre approach, or you can just be trying to get that good ball to hit. Uh, what's that kind of interesting here is this famous, uh, this famous photo here from Ted Williams' Science of Hitting, 1970, has all his, what he thinks to be his averages, you know, 270 down here in the corner and 400 and 360. Of course, now we could actually make this graph for every batter, every pitch, every every pitcher, but what, what are we going to do with that? What more can we do with that? Um, so we look at pitch recognition now being it's something that we value, certainly, certainly valued throughout uh, baseball, and we can measure some of the nice metrics we have beyond uh, batting average or even on base. I particularly like the O swings, outside the zone swings. If you had one thing to measure, they count that, you know, 30% being pretty good. Lance Berkman being 25%, not bad. Walk to strikeout ratio, another excellent metric. 0.5, good. One, excellent, Berkman land again. Um, line drive percentage, I, I, I don't care about the uh, contact ones, but you know, good contact. Okay, we've got that above the line. In, uh, in, in Moneyball, the book, um, Michael Lewis asked, okay, if this is so, so valued in the A's organization, at the time, Billy Bean said that you couldn't, you couldn't earn an honor for minor league player of the month in the A's system unless you got your requisite number of walks, 10% walks. Once you hit that walk, didn't matter what else you did, you weren't gonna get it. So we could, we could reward it, they're, they're valuing that. He asked, Michael Lewis asked then, okay, if that's so valued, can you develop that in players? And he said, yes, but only if we get them in diapers. And that's where we're at, below the waterline to test and to train this highly sought after skill, we don't have a lot. You know, it's basically still seen as a, as a nature over nurture, trait versus state, something that's in there, it's a talent, as opposed to something that we can train up as much as we would any other skill. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at being able to test it and train it that systematically. Now, people have tried to do this over the years with vision training, and I'm not going to knock vision training. I mean, uh, Russell Brannion uh, had a breakthrough year a, a couple of years ago uh, with the Mariners and attributed that to Dr. Barry Seiler's visual edge training he'd done in the off season. Great, whatever works for different people. And how can increasing your vision skills not help in a fastball sport? But it's not the it of pitch recognition, nor is painting different colored dots or putting numbers on baseballs and firing them out of, a, out of a pitching machine. It's a nice drill, but it's not the it. The it requires looking at pitches, looking at release points, picking up those cues, those minute cues that are there 20 yards away that tell that expert just a little bit of information that the novice doesn't pick up. And in the uh, baseball panel, Scott Boris mentioned um, Harvey Dorfman, the late great Dar Har Harvey, Harvey Dorfman. And this, is, this, is, this graphic is from his book. And he breaks, 
pitch recognition down into three zones. And, and this is just a theory for Harvey. He doesn't have any science backing this up. As I'll show you, though, he's dead on. Zone one being an out of a hand to about a third of the ball flight, and then a, a zone two, three. And Dorfman would say, not everybody has to be great everywhere. So we can think of somebody like a Tony Gwynn as maybe a zone two, three type hitter, guy who can cover a strike zone the size of a car door, put a good, good lick on almost anything. Or we can think of a Frank Thomas, big guy, long swing. If he doesn't see that ball right out of the hand, if he doesn't know that that's a slider where he doesn't want it off the corner or the inside pitch, this two inches inside he could always take, he doesn't have a chance. We don't even need to have a measurable to know that, pit, that, that Frank Thomas is a big zone one pitch recognition guy and couldn't succeed without it. So what's uh, kind of interesting then, what we're really after here, is the research that's been done in this. Within an expert novice research paradigm, sports science. Now, most of this sports science research, starting in the early 80s, has been done in Australia, the Australian Institute of Sport, been done at various places, and so they've looked uh, probably more than anything else at return of serve, you know, the ballistic serve, reading that, or cricket. But there have been a few studies in the area of baseball, and not surprisingly, they show that Dorfman was dead on. That within this zone, right here, there's a difference between what experts and novices, and by novices they don't mean somebody who doesn't play ball, they mean more advanced and less advanced. This is where you start to see a difference. If you show them more than this, experts, novices, pretty much can guess it. Cut it back before the point of release, uh, everybody's pretty much at chance. In this window right here is our expert advantage. We're talking about 150 milliseconds. One third of ball flight, about 10, 10 to 12 feet out of the hand. That's where it's happening. That's a hard blink. Blink as fast as you can, that's 150 milliseconds. So that's the time frame that we're looking at. Not only that, but they would find that the expert's advantage increased the closer you got to moment of release. Their performance was going down. The experts, of course, can't guess the, the pitch type if they see less ball flight better than they could. But the difference between the expert and the novice gets bigger and bigger. In other words, this right in here becomes the point of maximum expert advantage. So what I then was, was take this exact research protocol, I mean the exact research protocol, and use it to train it. If that's where the sports science locates this expert advantage, then we ought to be able to repurpose that for training purposes. That's what we did. Then what we're going to do so is this, this film goes all the way back to, uh, um, well, about 12 years, so I, I had to point out some of the old right things. But the that's release. what we used to call a mullet. Thing. You don't see any ball flight at all. This is VHS tape for some of you young guys in the audience. You might not know what that is. That's projection television. It's pretty obsolete stuff. And we're working in a very raw sort of, sort of way here. Uh, but this is science. This is a scientific lab, scientific training. And so what we see is this is what they call the video occlusion method. You're seeing point of view video, and the, the batter is just guessing the type of pitch. Yes. With instant feedback. So you're getting your guess, yeah, instant good. feedback. And he's at that highest level of MOR, Basketball. that is moment of release. Yes. I had them do 10, 15 minute training sessions. Basketball. The guys would go yes. running down, they were doing their regular winter workouts in the indoor football yes. facility, good. and they'd come up one at a time for 15 minutes of the training with me. Basketball. Then they'd run back down there. Now watch. Basketball. Split. Oh. A curve. Split. Fastball. Good. Split. Good. Okay. Fastball. So there, there you see, there you, you just saw it. You just saw the magic. Fastball. Yes. You saw the magic of pitch recognition. It's not about some general Split. skill. He could Good. do this. He's he's going along. It's, did you see what happened the first time he got split by that, that first split that he saw? He, he's actually yeah. like this. He's Dude, locking himself in. There's a whole, whole different today, thing man. being set in now. What, he's what, leaning what forward. You see, you you know, a whole different thing, and, and, and he's struggling with it. And he's, uh, he struggles to get the next time. one, and oh, then he's locked in again and going in. the way he holds his ball. Because you get those shit like this. Yeah, that's what I picked up, and I knew the changeup was coming. And then a curveball, I missed it the first time, but then I saw he was over the top. I don't know, I picked that up, but fastball was pretty easy. You know, so that's exactly what we're talking about. How fast do guys pick it up? Okay, he says he picked up the curveball over the top. Some guys, they'll say, well, I see skinny wrist. 
And we don't do a lot of training them on exactly what to look for, because what one guy sees is different from what another guy's going to see. The thing is to set up the conditions of learning so that, that that magic thing in the brain can happen. We're not trying to control that. We're not trying to run it. I'm not even saying we can train it. I'm not even saying we understand what it is. But we know where it is. The science has located it for us. It's located the window of expert advantage, and it's given us a way to train it up. So that's what we're doing, training in a very drill-like manner with lots and lots of repetition, immediate feedback, and progressive difficulty. Those three things. We do that with a set of drills. We're not just having them do the same thing over and over again. One day we're working on pitch type. Another day we're working on pitch location uh, with a known type. For instance, with these college ball players, these were all D1 college ball players, they wouldn't believe when you showed them that short video that a pitch like this and the ball came out like that looks like it's headed for the third row. That's a strike. That's a curveball that's going to drop in for a strike. And they actually wouldn't believe it. I'd have to show them the whole view for them to even believe that that's what it was. So sometimes you're just working on location off of that. Sometimes we'd be, we'd be pairing pitches that are hard for people to pick up. S fastball, splitter, or change at the bottom of the zone sort of thing. And then this hit ahead zone, which is strictly the players love this one. You take all the recognition, all the thinking out of it. You just say, what's the zone you're looking for? We block off that part as swing, don't swing. And that really is that Ted Williams selective hitting, you know, hit ahead. It takes a lot more discipline to hit ahead in the count than it does behind in the count. The results of that were um, uh, actually pretty substantial. And I invite anybody who's interested in the science of that and the metrics of it uh, to look at the paper. You can go onto my website, uh, peterfatty.com, and download the paper called Baseball, and it'll have the whole scientific e experiment within here. The thing is, we actually came up with, you know, pretty substantial results. These results are NCAA statistics, not my statistics, from the 18-game pre-conference schedule of this team before they started their D1 uh, leagues, Big Ten leagues. Now, this was a northern team traveling south for their first uh, set of games, so you can see the stats are not all that high. You know, they're going down and playing LSU and stuff. But, uh, but you can see a distinct advantage, and in fact, a statistically significant advantage, which is an extremely bold claim with a small end steady where you're talking about transfer from a trained skill to actual performance with people who already were at a high level on that ceiling effect. So you guys studying your research design, you know that that's a very bold claim. I'd love to see it replicated, but it's hard work, so <laughs> I'd love to see somebody else replicate it. So what we see is that this approach, this, this science-based approach of video occlusion, in fact, can be a pretty successful training mode. We've got two different kinds of simulators there, and if I asked people in the room, okay, you know, raise your left hand for the pro batter, right-handed for, for video occlusion of which looks like the higher fidelity simulation. You know, I don't even have to have you do it to know how it comes out. Everybody says, yeah, sure. This is just like batting. And it is. This is a pitcher here. There's a batting machine back there. It can fire sliders and everything else out there. So this one is in every way higher fidelity than this one, except for that eye blink at the release of the pitch. So if what we're working on is pitch recognition, this is much, much higher fidelity. Now, what are the implications? What are the implications of saying that we can train this, the mental part only? Decouple the perception action link. Train them up on either side. Now we do that with the physical part of it all the time. We don't even think twice about it. We're saying we're gonna decouple the perception action link. We're gonna train up that recognition part separately, completely separately, on a laptop computer, on your lap while you're watching, on the bus, during rehab, off season. You can go mobile with it. What does that mean for what we're talking about doing this and being able to, to work on that? Imagine the, you know, the, a, a, a team in the, uh, in, the, in the rookie league, you know, in the instructional league, rumbling from, from uh, Macon to, to, to Myrtle Beach, and they're passing the, lap, the laptop or the tablet back and forth, drilling, working. Now, a company, Exxon Potential, who'd be talking in here 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, has taken this to a completely new level in terms of the fidelity and the quality of what we're doing. But they have maintained the science with 100% fidelity. It is still the same video occlusion. They have not gone into any kind of 3D haptic feedback, virtual reality type of thing. 
it's still baseballs being pitched, baseballs being recognized at a whole new level. So what does that give us then? What does it mean and where do we go from here? The first thing is that we want to build up a base of predictive validity. So what we need is some, some cooperating ball teams give us some access to players with known performance stats. And then we can develop our pitch recognition profile, try and work out a 10 minute assessment on the laptop computer, we can give it to, to everybody, and then we start to correlate how that matches with their known statistics, a predictive profile, and then we can run that with guys who we don't know their performance yet. And you know, that's the kind of thing then that, 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 that some of the people in the, in the baseball analytics panel just now were talking about. You know, it was what Bill James said. He says, okay, we've got all this information about Major League Baseball. That's what we have, but what we need is information about other places, whether that's a Dominican League or that's a, that's a farm ball league in Indiana or wherever these other places are, you can't trust their metrics. So what does it mean if we have uh, a reliable, predictive sort of test? We can give them the computer. Here, 10-minute test, take this. Call it a game, somewhat game-like. I think we might even be able to have the confidence as we put this together to work at the highest level with a, with a diagnostic type of approach. Um, Rocco Baldelli in the, uh, in the baseball analytics panel said the one question he wanted to see answered in the future was why some people can hit and some people can't hit. I'm going to take a little bit of license with that and restate it. Rocco, help, if, see if we're still, still with it here as the question of why some people who can hit, hit, and why some people who can hit, don't hit. That's what I'm going to say is the question that we're trying to get after. And this might give us a little bit of a way into that. If you've got a guy who's got the swing mechanics, you know, he's got the right approach, he works on his game, everything is there, and somehow the magic isn't happening, is it here? Is it here? Is it a pitch recognition issue? Now, again, going back to, to putting it with the, uh, with, with the metrics, I love this one that they have on the fan graphs where they're, it's a reversal of the, the pitching data from uh, PitchFX. So they're doing it, they're calling it the weighted PitchFX times 100. And it breaks it down pitch by pitch by pitch how a guy does against that pitch. That's a tremendous, there, there's some, I, I, somebody said, you know, uh, um, Mark Shapiro said, what if, we gave, what if we gave everybody in the room, you know, a chance to make decisions that we make just based on available information? That's available information, that's fan graphs. But there's a problem with it. It's not accurate on pitch type. There's an algorithm guessing the pitch type. Or there's somebody at the ballpark guessing the pitch type. Something is guessing the pitch type. Whereas with the, with the um, assessment we'd be putting together on the, on the computer, it's absolutely 100% accurate on pitch type. Now, it doesn't bring you the same level of information you're getting where you're having the performance data against real pitchers. But what it's doing is it's giving you, it's giving you a behavioral measure to match with your performance metrics. Now we're starting to really triangulate something. And it's just like with the vision training versus the PR training. You know, these are, are more tools in the kit. It's not one of these being better than the other one. It's starting to put these things together, using them together. They're tools in the kit. So we take the tool of the kind of analytics that are being developed by so many people out here, and we start to put those behavioral measures together with, uh, or our behavioral measures together with some performance measures like that. Now we're on to something. Now you can take somebody at even the highest level. That, they may or may not train with this. They might go and say, okay, that's targeted. I know that my problem is that I'm swinging at too many pitches below the zone. They probably could have told you that anyway. You're just validating it for them. Now we might take that data and we might hand it over to a batting coach who would handle it in some you know, old fashioned, uh, you know, smell the, um, the, the, the leather and the glove oil type of way, fine. Great, we don't have, have to do that. But this would also be a way to train that specific one and do it in a non-hitting atmosphere. So it's very low overhead. Uh, and then we could potentially do that with game 
preparation and you say, well, we wouldn't have the pitchers. No, but the guy I showed you was tall, lanky left-hander. Maybe he looks like a little like David Price. No? And the real payoff, the real payoff in the long run, which is development. Starting with guys, Scott Boris had said, even at age 12, you know, was where you start tracking them. But isn't that where we should also start developing them? You know, so that working on your pitch recognition becomes something that you do in addition to working on your conditioning, in addition to working on your swing mechanics. It's just another tool in the kit. And, and that's all we're trying to get to. We're trying to leverage the science, good science, and give us another tool in the kit that has been unrecognized uh, to this point. So, you know, that's where we're at with the sixth tool. I invite you to uh, send me directly any kind of comments. Um, uh, very welcome, especially from this group. Check the website, peterfatty.com. You can download, as I said, the uh, academic paper. There's also a, a, a much shorter article for, from Collegiate Baseball on pitch recognition. And um, Axon Potential has a blog, really discusses all this stuff in a great way. And they've got their presentation tomorrow morning at, at 9 o'clock to really show you what they're doing with this tool. Come on. Talk about how well this generalizes across different release points and arm angles for pitchers. I like that question because it, it, that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to generalize. So a lot of times coaches will say, wow, that's great. If I can get my opponent pitchers on that, well, obviously you're not going to. The question is, how many do you need to see uh, across different arm angles, et cetera? And that is the kind of question. That's the real research. That's where we need to go next with the real research. You know, do you need a set of five? pitchers to do that, or do you need like 50? You know, how, how much of that do you need to keep working on? Uh, but I, tr I treat this, even though I say training, it's more like a, almost a conditioning thing. So I would say that there's a certain amount that you need to work on establishing a baseline, and then you just keep adding more and more. You just keep doing more and more different types of pitchers. And again, in that preparation one, if you happen to be preparing for a guy who has a, a funky delivery, uh, you know, a sidearm or so something like that, you know, then you try and find something close. But we're more interested in that generalizable skill. I'll have to put you off on exactly how many it takes. I hope to come back in a year with some research that answers that question. Now that we've got the tool that we can, that we can use to do that. Over here. Uh, how'd you split up your treatment and control group for that college hitting study that you did? Yeah, what I did was uh, tr separate the batters into two groups. And um, uh, they were ranked and then randomly assigned to treatment or control. And now the control guys didn't do nothing. They got extra batting practice. Because like I said, it was right during their winter uh, workouts. And so the guys were actually skipping some of their batting practice to come up and, and do 15 minutes on there. So it was a matched pair. It's a small end. There, there, are nine, there were nine guys in each group. So it's not huge numbers. But we could, because of the methodology, we could say that we had equivalent groups. So then we just need to look at the difference. We didn't need a pre-post or any of that. Uh, but you know, certainly uh, look at the paper from the website and offer any comments on that. Because like I say, I'd like to run more of these now that we have a much easier to use and better tool. And if you see a place to, improvement, to improve it, I'm all for it. Come on, we done? Good, thank you.